Several schools of macroeconomic thought have developed over the nearly 100 years since the Great Depression gripped the United States. Though the U.S.'s fiscal and monetary policy responses have been largely shaped by four of them. The first is the classical school, most closely associated with David Ricardo and his 1817 writing, Principles of Political Economy and Taxation. In today's terms, Ricardo was focusing on what we call the long-run aggregate supply curve, or full employment. In the orthodox classical school, the flexibility of prices in free markets allows an underperforming or overheating economy to self-correct um, towards its long-run full employment. There was no need for the government to intervene, and by classical economist logic, they could actually make things worse by intervening. During the economic slump of the late 1920s and early 1930s, the classical school taught that this deviation from potential output would be short-lived and the economy would soon correct itself through price adjustments. But while the developed world was plunged into a depression, in the UK, a less traditional economist named John Maynard Keynes was completing his magnum opus, The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money, which flew in the face of many classical thoughts. In it, Keynes laid out the argument that suggested a framework for understanding how a recession could become the long-lived depression that gripped the world. For Keynes, in the long run, we are all dead. Until then, phenomena like price stickiness could keep markets from fully adjusting to exogenous changes, causing long-lasting periods of equilibrium unemployment. Those long-lasting periods would occur because aggregate demand would persistently remain below what would be necessary to sustain full employment, flipping onto its head a key principle of classical economics, Say's law, that supply creates demand. In this framework, aggregate demand could determine the state of the economy. As a consequence, it may be necessary for the government to intervene and support aggregate demand, even with deficit spending if other components of the economy were unwilling or unable to maintain the demand levels. Keynes' framework seemed consistent with the events leading up to and during the Great Depression. Drops in aggregate demand likely overwhelmed any gains from reductions in labor costs to what we understand today to be the short-run aggregate supply curve. For the U.S., aggregate demand probably didn't start rising fast enough until President FDR's New Deal programs in the 19, late 1930s and 1940s accompanied an outsized spending and production in support of inevitably entering World War II. After World War II, Keynes' ideas continued to influence fiscal policy and the global financial order for decades. Despite hesitation about running budget deficits, the Kennedy administration soon embraced Keynesian economics in the 60s as it strove to compete with the USSR in the space race. But macroeconomics was still relying on the aggregate expenditures model. That model didn't incorporate the concept of potential output, which inherently incorporates price level changes as an endogenous or internal variable. Economists were still thinking about the economy's potential largely in terms of employed people. And the Kennedy administration, observing an unemployment rate above 5%, whereas full employment was thought to be as low as 4%, petitioned Congress for a tax cut in 1963 intended to expand the economy. There was no understanding of needing to balance expansionary policy with inflation. The requested tax cut didn't pass until 1964, after Kennedy's assassination. It was followed by a more incredibly expansionary financial policy from the Lyndon B. Johnson administration. And by then, it was highly likely that the U.S. economy was well past its potential output and into an inflationary gap. The Lyndon B. Johnson administration did recommend a tax hike, but it wasn't enacted until 1968 and it was likely too small of a contractionary fiscal response to an even wider inflationary gap. By the time the Nixon administration took over in 1969, the unemployment rate had fallen to 3.6%, and inflation had soared to 4.3%. Cooling started to happen, though. Between 1969 and 1970, after the onslaught of expansionary policy came to an end, the economy's real GDP barely grew at all, and inflation grew a whopping 6%. This was unusual for Keynesian framework applied to the aggregate expenditure model. There was no reason to expect prices to climb as economic activity cooled. This began a tug of war during the first half of the 1970s between the Nixon administration trying to keep inflation low while stimulating economic activity. 
Nixon's efforts were thrown off track by the 1973 oil crisis, which surged prices throughout the economy. The administration's efforts were also somewhat counterproductive, as actions like price and wage caps suppressed inflation for a while, but led to higher levels of unemployment and future commodity shortages. By the end of the Nixon administration, inflation had climbed to 8.7%, and unemployment reached 5.6%. The U.S. press coined the term stagflation to describe the unusually dismal turn the economy had taken. The second half of the 1970s, in many ways, was a repeat of Canadian economics failing to break stagflation. The Gerald Ford administration flipped between contractionary and expansionary policies. At the end of his term, stagflation was reined in as unemployment and inflation both did start falling in 1976. But Ford's political capital was spent and the federal government was in the largest post-war budget deficit experience. The federal government wouldn't run a balanced budget actually again until the 1990s. But before any of this occurred, two economists at the National Bureau of Economic Research were working on a groundbreaking publication called A Monetary History of the United States that would present monetary policy and specifically the money supply as a pivotal influencer of the U.S. economy. One of those economists, Milton Friedman, went on to advocate for less activist intervention from the Federal Reserve, suggesting that changes in the money supply could drive gains and losses in nominal GDP. This was largely based on an econometric analysis from his publication, which showed strong relationships between changes in the M2 measure of money and nominal GDP lag. According to the quantity theory of money, this relationship could only hold through the impact of the money supply on inflation. This was considered a monetarist framework of the economy and garnered more attention in the 1970s as a potential explanation for how inflation could climb even while fiscal and monetary authorities were taking contractionary approaches to managing the economy. To economists like Milton Friedman, fiscal and monetary policymakers were playing a perpetual game of whack-a-mole due to the inherent lags that policy dealt with, and potentially they could cause more harm than good. They and the nation were much better off with sticking to consistent and predictable behaviors while allowing the economy to self-correct out of problems. While Friedman was on the last stretch of his 30 years of teaching at the University of Chicago, another young economist who would pose a competing theory to explain the coming years of stagflation was just earning his PhD. Robert Lucas would build upon Friedman's view of monetary policy as neutral to the real economy with his pioneering of the rational expectations theory. The theory revived classical economic analysis by connecting the rational individualism typical of classical microeconomics to macroeconomics by suggesting that in aggregate, the rational reactions of agents in an economy would offset the short run real impact on monetary policy upon the economy. If, for example, the Fed tried to contract the economy by reducing the money supply Rational actors would presume that such a policy would reduce employment and inflation. They would react to it by changing expectations about wages so that prices would fall even further in the economy without a substantial change in employment. As another example, if the economy was facing high rates of inflation and low unemployment, and policymakers decided to fight inflation by reducing government spending on, let's say, welfare programs, rational actors like businesses would expect that spending decreases to raise unemployment and lower prices, and may, in anticipation, cut back on their output to avoid having excess inventories. If the reactions weren't proportionally perfect, it was possible for the economy to end up with both higher unemployment and higher inflation. This was pivotal to Lucas's critique, which became the backbone of the new classical school of economics. According to Lucas, macroeconomics should be congruent to our understanding of microeconomics, in such a way that macroeconomic relationships were understood as holding only so far as they represented the aggregation of rational individual decisions. Although Friedman retired from the University of Chicago in 1977, he continued to influence economic thinking through think tanks, fiscal advisory positions, and editorials until his death in 2006. His death marked the end of an era as the buildup to the nation's worst economic crisis since the Great Depression would push the entire globe to reconsider Keynesian teachings against the advice of Friedman and other monetarists. 2008 financial crisis put to an end what was considered by many economists to be the Great Moderation. Since 1982, the U.S. only ever experienced mild recessions and saw exponential economic growth. 
Over that time, a lot changed in our understanding of the economy through older frameworks. For example, the relationship between M2 and lag nominal GDP broke, likely due to bank deregulation of the 80s and 90s. This opened the door also to instability in the long-run implied velocity of money, a further deterioration of monetary risk analysis. Additionally, reactions to monetary and fiscal policies in the late 1970s and early 1980s compounded by advancements in behavioral economics in the late 1990s, put into doubt the idea that in aggregate economic agents could be expected to react rationally to economic information. The Great Recession was the consequence of the 2008 financial crisis. Out of it emerged a larger consensus around what is known as New Keynesian economics. The New Keynesian school includes acknowledgement of price stickiness and the need for activist stabilization policies that shift the aggregate demand curve. It acknowledges that an aggregate model of macroeconomics is incomplete if it doesn't consider that changes in price levels are endogenous or internal to the model. It incorporates monetarist concepts like the quantity theory of money and new classical considerations of microeconomic reactions. In the wake of the economic collapse of 2008, economists across the globe and the philosophical spectrum advocated for Keynesian-esque expansionary fiscal policies. Today, it would be hard to argue that most macroeconomists don't broadly accept the principles that underpin the new Keynesian school of thought. What you've been trained in is for the most part this school of thought, but it would be naive to think it will be the last iteration of macroeconomics ever taught. And it certainly isn't the only one taught today. If you've learned nothing else by now, hopefully you've learned that the economy really is a living, breathing creature all its own and our understanding of it will only grow in nuance and complexity as time progresses and our scientific tools of analysis become more precise.